Good afternoon. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the launch of Commit Global. I'm Diana Eggleston. I'm the business advisor, impact economy and NGOs at The Hague and Partners. Over the past year, I've had the pleasure of accompanying Commit Global on their journey to The Hague. And we're thrilled that they've chosen the International City of Peace and Justice as their home for their headquarters. This afternoon, we'll hear from a number of distinguished speakers. Ambassador Wim Gertz, Ambassador for Human Rights at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mayor of The Hague, Jan van Zanen, Member of the Board, Chris Woman, and of course, the Founder and CEO of Commit Global, uh, Bogdan Ivanel. We'll be led through this afternoon's program by Olivia Vereha, She's the co-founder and vice president for product at Commit Global. Afterwards, there will be an opportunity to get to know each other better and, of course, to raise a glass to Commit Global. Thank you all for joining us for this exciting event, and I would like to hand over to Olivia. Thank you, Diana, for the introduction. We're very happy to be here in The Hague for what is probably the first of many, many meetings with each and every one of you in the room, or so we hope at this moment. We're grateful that you have joined us, and we're grateful that you have the curiosity to get to know what this new organization, Commit Global, is about. We'll first hear from our guests, uh, whom we thank for being here, and more importantly, for being with us all along our journey as an organization setting up here in The Hague. As Diana was saying, we'll have time for questions and answers through this entire meeting, and we hope to spend as many hours as possible together to set the, stones, the first stones of our very beautiful friendship together, because I'm sure that over here we'll find that we have common values, we believe in the same kind of solutions for the future, and we want to be part of the team that The Hague is today. This being said, um, I definitely don't want to keep you waiting. You'll see a lot of me today as I will bounce in between the guests and introduce everybody. And uh, I'll join you in the, in, at the end of this event to also give you an, a bit of an insight on what Commit Global's work looks like and the kind of things we will be able to do together starting today. Um, our first guest, I would like to invite the Human Rights Ambassador um, to say a few words. And many, many thanks for being next to us and for being a great ally for us in, the, in this very important step in our journey. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Olivia. Um, good afternoon. It's great to see you all. Um, and on behalf of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I would like to uh, warmly congratulate uh, the Commit Global team on your launch here in The Hague. And as Diana was saying, we're thrilled that you are uh, calling The Hague uh, home from now on. Uh, and I think you took the best possible decision, he said objectively. Um, but indeed, you know, it's fitting that you are basing your civic infrastructure group in this international city of peace and justice. We wholeheartedly agree with Commit Global that civil society cannot thrive without technical support. And it's exciting to see how Commit Global is unlocking the promise of tech for the benefit of society. The Netherlands is committed to protecting and enhancing civic space and uh, the human rights defenders working in it, both online and offline. Promoting and protecting human rights has become increasingly difficult. In a world where the space to express yourself and speak truth to power is being restricted. During my time as the Dutch ambassador to China from 2019 until last month, uh, I saw this with my own eyes and it was not pretty. That's an understatement. Technological progress can be a driving force of global cooperation and innovation but it can also be a tool of oppression. 
Repressive actions by governments and corporations are limiting the maneuvering room for human rights defenders. For instance, when states resort to internet shutdowns that silence them and block them from reaching their audience, or when defenders are placed under surveillance without due cause. This can instill fear and drive self-censorship, and it limits their ability to organize actions in their networks. Those most at risk are often not well equipped to defend themselves digitally. They have limited capacity to anticipate uh, risks and to respond to threats. And this shows how important it is to equip human rights defenders to respond, for instance, using the technology that Commit Global gives them. At the Dutch Foreign Ministry, we've seen how the technical solutions that Commit Global provides empower responders to fight human rights violations. Commit Global's work to ensure IT security for the Save Ukraine team allowed them to scale up their efforts to return Ukrainian children who had been forcibly deport, deported to Russia, an appalling act. Without ensuring online safety, operations of this kind could not take place because everyone involved would be at risk of being tracked and or wiretapped. We commend, commend, uh, sorry, we commend Commit Global for working on the technological resources and building the capacity needed to protect civil society from digital security threats. The rapid digitalization of our global society is beyond any measure. A significant proportion of everyone's time is spent online. Technology can be a driving force in accelerating progress around the globe. It's giving more and more people a voice, and it can promote open societies and foster public debate. This makes technology a vital enabler of the enjoyment of fundamental and universal human rights, such as freedom of expression and the right of peaceful assembly. That's why we fully support Commit Global's mission to unlock the promise of tech for social good and its efforts to provide civil society with a comprehensive civic infrastructure. We welcome Commit Global's focus on reusing technology to lower the cost of maintaining digital infrastructure. And we look forward to having you here in The Hague and wish you every success in your endeavors. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words. Um, this may seem like an event about technology, but it's actually, it's an event about people. And I hope that um, through these hours that we're going to spend together, you will see that how important it is to put everything, uh, to put the person at the center of everything that you build, be it technical, online, or offline, and so on. And because we're talking about people, um, the next speaker that's coming here is one of the persons that has been with us for the entirety of our journey, the person who has uh, helped us define our mission, define our strategy, and the person who has helped us grow every single time we were faced with a new challenge in, in our journey together. Chris Warman if, is one of our board members, and we definitely hope to spend the next uh, dozens of years uh, moving forward together because we have shown time and time again that together we do an excellent team and that we can put, to, uh, put forward really good infrastructure for social good. Chris, would you like to join us and tell us how it has it been to be our board member so far? So far, so good. Um, <clears throat> so thank you and welcome everybody. I've spent about 20 years at the intersection of civic technology, finance, and social justice from long forgotten tools like voicemail for the homeless, which sounds a little crazy, but had hundreds of thousands of users, to some of the modern contemporary sort of AI solutions. We'll see how those work out. I've certainly been excited along the way by the potential, by the human enjoyment, seeing thousands 
of people with technology skills work on challenges. I've also been extremely frustrated by our abilities to support them to really realize the potential that technology has in our digitalizing world. Over those years, I've rarely been as excited as I have been about commit. So, pretty well as a board member. Um, why? Well, fundamentally, one reason. There was an article in The Economist recently that called out that 20% of disasters are predicted. Not just predictable, predicted. 185 million people a year are displaced by disaster. 20% of the time, we know it's coming. The majority of the time, we can predict it is coming. It is overwhelmingly predictable due to weather patterns, signs of war, these sorts of things. The logistical and human needs, once disaster strikes, are always predictable. We know what people need. We've been through these issues. It is extremely rare that we haven't. The closest most of us in this room have ever been, thankfully for many, is probably pandemic lockdown. For those of you that lived in a country that locked down, I was in the Bay Area, March 7th, everybody stay home. What do you do? You pick up your phone, you start searching. What, where do I turn for help now? For food? Is, is the Trader Joe's even open anymore? Like, what are we going to do? Where do I get information? And that's a luxury. That's a luxury to be able to pull out your phone and look. If you're displaced in a war zone, in a place without electricity, that's, even that's not really an option. Meanwhile, governments are running around. Civil society organizations, disaster relief organizations are running around trying to remember what technology they used last time. Who has it? Do we remember the password? Can we get it off the shelf and dust it off? Does it still work? Is it broken? The code isn't working. We're losing time. And unfortunately, all too often, we're losing lives. Why? Because we, as humanity, have not committed to foresight. We have not committed to the core and shareable infrastructure that would allow us to avoid entirely predictable situations. We know what's coming. We haven't financed appropriately. We have not insured ourselves. That seems silly. Commit, that's an understatement. <laughs> Commit offers us an alternative. An alternative, as will be described, that with global warming and all of the interstate fragilities that we have around us, we have got to take seriously. There's a quote, always misattributed to Einstein, no proof that he actually said it, that trying the same thing again and again and expecting different results is the definition of insanity. It seems like we owe it to those who are much more vulnerable than ourselves to do better. So thanks for being here today because I think that's what we're committing to do. Congratulations, team. Thank you so much, Chris, for your kind words. And I think you've managed to, um, to actually comprise the essence of our work in just, uh, just a few words. I think the rest of us can just go home with our speeches. <laughs> you've pinpointed pretty much everything that was, uh, was of great essence. Um, I'm going to tell you a very short personal story of when I first came to The Hague and we had a meeting at The, the Hague Municipality. Um, I, I've worked a lot, I come from Eastern Europe and I'm, uh, I, I've interacted a lot with Eastern European institutions, I've worked a lot with NGOs in a lot of contexts um, where you have to do a lot with little and where you have to be very creative with either technology or either infrastructure and where you have to, to gain a lot of trust in order to build collaboration. And I think that the first feeling that I got when I went into the meeting uh, with the local municipality was the fact that 
you can actually truly set up collaboration when you find those common threads um, in between the actors that come together with the same mission of helping vulnerable people. I think it's not by chance that we are here. We are um, an organization that has inspired a lot from the Dutch methods because our founders have always have been living here in the Netherlands for a very long time. And it was, it was actually a, a funny thing one, uh, one person at some point, uh, some point in time said, we are actually a Dutch organization with a lot of Romanian drive in it. And I'm really happy that today you get to know these, uh, you know, get to know us how exactly we are and how we try to bring together all of these very, very necessary ingredients all together. Um, Commit Global uh, is an initiative that may start today uh, officially as a headquarter in The Hague, but it has behind it eight years of work with the most vulnerable of us, uh, eight years of support brought to civil society organizations, and what's most important, eight years of learning from the field and understanding how technology can actually be put to good use, uh, to good use in these situations. I told you you're going to see quite a lot of me uh, and you're gonna hear a lot from me uh, today. Um, I would like now to actually start opening the door for you to actually start seeing what Commit Global is about, to understand where this has, uh, has started from, and to hear directly from, uh, from our founder, founder Bogdan. We wish we had this back in Lebanon, were the words of the regional head of the UNHCR when, they, when he first witnessed our humanitarian infrastructure deployed in support of Ukrainian refugees last year. Lebanon and Afghanistan, Syria and Ukraine, Ethiopia and Sudan, the headlines are chasing each other out. On Saturday it was Morocco, on Tuesday it was Libya. The fact that we live in a time of systemic crisis is not, ma not a matter of perception anymore. Social cleavages are running even deeper and more violent than ever. Democracy is on the retreat, humanitarian emergencies are proliferating day in and day out, and the existential threat of climate change is exponentially showing its claws. As a collective effect of all these crises, bigger chunks of the world population is becoming vulnerable and depending on us every day to support them. It increasingly feels like a race we cannot win, and yet we consistently underuse and misuse the most effective scaling mechanism of today, technology. We have seen it scale business, we have seen it scale profit, we have seen it scale crime, we have seen it scale autocracy. If we are to win the race against the global crisis or today, we have to see it scale the power of the good guys, of the civil society and its first responders. We have shown that well-designed, well-built technology deployed with attention to the needs of those on the ground can save lives. And not only can it save lives, but it can save lives and protect lives at scale. My colleagues are giving out one of the many essentials you take for granted, a bottle of water. <laughs> Let's think about this for a moment. For those left vulnerable by life, by war, or by disaster, water is more vital than ever. Donating the water they need does not solve the problem, does it? It needs to get to the thirsty, wherever they are. But where are they? Do we know how to locate them? Do, do they know how to locate us? Do they know how to ask for help? Our aid management solutions make sure these needs are efficiently mapped on the ground and water gets to those who need it and is not wasted in the process. In times of trouble, our infrastructure for good becomes a lifeline. It connects thirst with water. It connects the homeless with empty beds. It connects the sick with healthcare. It connects the lost and scared to vital information. Creating not only scale and efficiency in accessing services, but traceability and integration, while placing the beneficiary, the most vulnerable of us, at the center of these ecosystems. Since I started talking a few minutes ago, over a dozen Ukrainian families access these vital services through the humanitarian infrastructure, 
we set up in just 48 hours a year ago. And deployed for free in support of governments, NGOs, and UN agencies. This is the proof of scale that only technology can unlock. It is now needed in Lebanon, in Afghanistan and Sudan, in Yemen and Ethiopia, and everywhere else in the world. It would have saved lives in Libya and Morocco this week. It will save lives in the Netherlands, in Spain, in the near future. Our vision is of a shared infrastructure for good, a civic infrastructure that offers every NGO around the world the basic solutions they need to manage their affairs effectively, from raising donations to making sense of their data, from building a website or managing their volunteers to managing their finances so that they can focus on what really matters, their mission and the intervention on the ground. This set of 18 solutions is just being deployed in Romania, Moldova, and Georgia as we speak. A civic infrastructure that enables activists and journalists to defend their communities and democracy, to bring about more transparency and ensure free and fair elections. Next year, for the first time ever, our civic infrastructure will enable vote monitoring across the entire Union for the European elections. A humanitarian infrastructure that offers a 360 degree support mechanism that keeps them out of harm's way like it does now at the Ukrainian border. A humanitarian infrastructure that enables efficient disaster relief management anywhere in the world. My colleagues are working right now with the Moroccan authorities to deploy vital help. A humanitarian infrastructure ensuring protection for the most vulnerable among us. Finally, a climate infrastructure that accelerates our understanding of the crisis at hand while scaling the capacity to respond. We cannot do it. We cannot solve this crisis without harnessing the power of technology. And it is already too late. Our mission is to do exactly that, to consolidate, build, and deploy the vital digital infrastructure and do the hard work of maintaining it day in and day out for the first responders out there, for the NGOs, the international organizations, the UN agencies, and the governmental bodies around the world. Why shared? because we shouldn't continue to duplicate efforts at a cost that we cannot afford. We all work in the public service. And in a world where our response capacity is stretched to the maximum, and very often have to choose between saving lives in Afghanistan or saving lives in Ukraine, technology is one of the resources that can be shared among multiple stakeholders and among different geographies. The same case management system for the chronically ill can be used by UNICEF and Save the Children and by every other big or small organization working in the charities around the world. Our shelter management solutions can be used by side by side by UNHCR, IOM, Red Cross, governments, or Habitat for Humanity, as it is right now in the case of the Ukrainian response. A secured evidence collection system can be used by the international courts here in The Hague, by election observers or post-disaster data collectors. We don't need and we shouldn't build the same digital infrastructure 70 times or 300 times. And we shouldn't be in the position to maintain it 300 times at huge costs. When we can build it and maintain it once and deploy it all over the world to the organizations that need it. It just makes sense. The advantage is not only lower costs, but less vulnerability. Common standards, common data models, and single entry points for the ones in need no matter whose services they access, the Red Cross or the UN agencies. The byproducts are more traceability, accountability, transparency, and respect for public money. This is the fifth gear that has been eluding us for so many years in the fight for, with the global crisis. We cannot afford anymore to not become strategic about the use of technology for good. We cannot afford to continue to work in silos without a global mechanism in place. We cannot afford to continue without a shared infrastructure for good, civic, humanitarian, environmental. We have to access this fifth gear now while it is not too late. And for that, we need the Red Cross of the 21st century, commit global. But however dedicated we might be, we can't achieve something so ambitious without equally audacious and visionary partners. 
we were mentioning the Red Cross, an organization that has not only become synonymous with its host city and country, but it has always worked shoulder to shoulder with Geneva and Switzerland. What made us feel in the Netherlands and in The Hague, like in no other place in the world, is the fact that we haven't only found a host city and a host country, but true partners, ready to coordinate and build together with us. A partner that we never had to convince of the vision, of its merits, of its urgency, but with whom we have a shared approach and vision and with whom we can access this fifth gear for the benefit of all humanity. Thank you for making this commitment. It seems it is now up to us. Together, The Hague, the Netherlands, Commit Global, and the entire ecosystem of social change in this amazing city and country, most of it represented here in the room. It is up to us. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Thank you so much. It's hard to follow that speech, but I will do my best. All right. So now let's dive a bit deeper into how this infrastructure really works. And I have a question for you. How many programmers does it take to cross the border? None. Exactly, none. Well, some, but not in the way you think. For millions of people to be able to cross the border, we need a multidisciplinary team. My job, well, I, when I'm not standing here talking to you, obviously, is to make sure that technology is transformed into solutions that work for the most vulnerable of us. In my experience as a user experience designer, I'm specialized in delivering services um, in the public space. I've seen a lot of Cinderella stories. You know the story. A lovely lady has lost a very beautiful and unnecessarily expensive shoe. And then the prince finds it and goes on a journey to find the person who fits that shoe. And after many attempts, they live happily ever after once they found each other. Now the tragic thing about the Cinderella story is that many people had to suffer to try to fit in that shoe until the exact match was found. And for a long time, technology has done exactly that. We've developed shoes that did not fit the reality on the ground. And time and time again in crisis situations, we grab what we have at hand and try to patch it up and make it fit realities that developers, engineers, or designers have never actually seen before. At the same time, we have seen a lot of response to any kind of situations, big or small crisis, being planned and deployed from a service perspective and not refugee-centric. Many times it's more about what we have to offer to them and less about what they actually need and when they need it and how they need it. Regardless of the angle you look at it, we keep looking at technology as a means to an end and not as an enabler. We're not yet ready to be digital by design in our intervention. And in many cases, the technology that we use is actually making things worse and making us actually more vulnerable. Poorly designed software can make things much worse. The reality is because we, don't, because we don't use technology strategically, we have so many blind spots that will soon be in the dark. And let me tell you a story. I'd like to tell you how our humanitarian infrastructure Bogdan was talking about earlier came to be. When the war in Ukraine started on 24th of February 2022, our team at Commit Global was just recovering after two long years of COVID intervention. It was 10, 12 a.m. And a team member called and asked, when do we assemble? He actually meant to ask, when does the task force start? Task force is an internal mechanism for us that we deploy every time we're in a crisis. We know what we have to do. We had done it before. We had rehearsed it before. We had done it in the pandemic, and now we were doing it again. But we had never done it before in a war. In order for you to understand the space that this was happening in, this was taking place in Romania, simply by chance. But a country pretty much in the middle when it comes to everything from public service quality, healthcare, education, you name it. And as you may guess, pretty far from sustainable digital transformation. We didn't have proper digital infrastructure and definitely we had no clue on how to include digital in the response from the get-go. Also, nobody actually had real experience in civil society as well. None of our NGOs were humanitarian and yet they had to be. In the first hour after the war started, we planned what we had to build and deploy. We brought the expert in the room. And the, by the expert, I do not mean the software architect, I don't mean the developer, I don't mean the designer, we brought the humanitarian expert. We understood the journey of every refugee moving forward from the decision to leave the conflict area 
up to the point when they reach the Romanian border or the Moldovan or Polish one. We map the refugee journey, the refugee context, and the constraints and limitations that these journeys have. We identified the places where technology made sense to be used in this intervention, and we mapped the response that the country was getting ready for. We got in touch in a matter of hours with the Department for Emergency Situations, with the central government, with the UN agencies, and we got in touch with civil society who was already on the ground going to man the borders. Having both of these journeys side by side, we connected the, the two, and most importantly, we overlapped the threats for each of them. And then we had the ecosystem. It took us 48 hours to set up a single multilingual entry point for every single refugee or first responder to access where they can find all the information they need. Documents, services, <coughs> aid, verified housing, medical care, and much more. But this wasn't just one other platform among hundreds of others. For the first time, we had one platform. We brought together an unprecedented coalition of actors, the government, the UN agencies, civil society, all speaking with one single voice on one single platform, putting together all their communications capacity behind it. And then we had a shared infrastructure, saving time, saving funding, saving maintenance efforts, and enhancing the outreach capacity in, in seconds. Having this single source of official information has also helped refugees gain trust that the information is reliable, verified, provided by experts. We made it accessible, flexible, easy to reach and available 100% of the time. We made it trustworthy. The second step was to ensure the proper aid infrastructure. And in seven days since the war started, we had two complex platforms ensuring access to housing and all other types of resources. The shelter and aid managers have been designed together with experts in humanitarian assistance, authorities, and anti-trafficking CSOs. So we can understand how we can make sure that whatever resource or whatever space is provided to refugees is away from threats. Apo there, there's so much we can do with technology, and there's so much we can, we, we can actually bring together. I will be coming back to you um, with, uh, with more, uh, more details on this infrastructure and with a lot more information. But first, I would like to, to introduce our, our, our speaker, our last speaker of the, of the day, the person that has been and will be, we continue to hope to be, that it will be, our ally in the future that will help us bring these kind of life-changing situations. It's with great honor that I'm inviting you on stage, Mayor, and thank you for actually being able to be here with us today. I think a very kind improvisation. And was I reading, uh, well, uh, thank you, Olivia, um, was I reading uh, we are the people the world is waiting for. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones we're waiting, we've been waiting for. Never too modest. <laughs> I learned when I studied at Cornell. And you know, Olivia, the story about Cinderella uh, was a had a little other twist because you seem to be very sympathetic to the stepsisters, the bad stepsisters, who suffered trying to get in her shoe, and it wasn't her shoe. So um, the truth and service, and there is always another layer to stories, but I liked, I liked the metaphor. Hello, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Commit Global to The Hague. Our city Consider it a great honor that Commit Global has opened its global headquarters here. The arrival of Commit Global represents a valuable addition to the The Hague's international ecosystem, which is, with its innovative applications of civic technology, Commit Global is of great value to everyone involved with finding solutions to humanitarian issues. Commit Global's mission also closely matches The Hague's profile, a profile which, alongside traditional international law, increasingly includes the use of new technologies for the purpose of peace, justice, and humanitarian aid. Examples which come to mind in this context are The Hague Tech and, the, of course, the Humanity Hub. The Hague also regularly hosts leading cybertech gatherings, such as the annual GovTech events and the Hackathon for Good. I've been there, oh my God. 
since its founding, Comet Global has already helped millions of people, such as the many Ukrainian refugees, you, you gave the Moldavian uh, example, such as the many Ukrainian refugees who, are, who were able to cross the border safely thanks to an entire system of tools developed by Comet Global. Bravo. Another example that comes to mind is how Comet Global ensured during the coronavirus pandemic that people worldwide could get access to correct information about the pandemic. Comet Global has also been able to make a vital contribution to monitoring various elections, thereby helping to strengthen the democratic process. In short, in short, you could describe Commit Global as a, and I, I, I think this is a great honor because I, well, you could describe Commit Global as a digital red cross. Wow, an organization, and now we need the the the, the, the dogs with it, you know, with the no. Well, anyway, <laughs> a digital red cross, an organization which is in precisely the right place in the Hague. There are nine of you here at the moment, but I understand you intend to grow the workforce to more than 30 people in the next three years. I wish you every success. And please remember, and I also say it um, with the ambassador present here, and remember, if there is anything we can help you with, please let us know. And before I hand the floor back to Livia, Perhaps we could have a quick group photo here on the stage with the other speakers. Congratulations, feel at home in The Hague, and if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you so much for making the time to be with us today. And I think um, what the mayor's speech has managed to do is actually get me off my, all my emotions so far. So, and I think this is one very important message um, for everybody producing technology for social good. The fact that whenever you build something that's out there and it's supposed to service people, it's supposed to make them feel welcome. It's supposed to make them feel taken care of. It's supposed to make them feel like you thought of everything Right before, um, right before providing them with these services. I'm going to lure you back a bit in, into the story about uh, the digital humanitarian infrastructure we've put together. And I was telling you about the aid management. Information is great. Information is essential in these times of crisis. Providing information in a timely manner for as many people as possible also takes the burden off the first responders. You'll get less calls on the, on the emergency services. You'll get less questions in the refugee centers. You'll get less unknown in general. But aside from information, you also need to provide infrastructure for the people on the ground to actually do their job better, faster, and not having to worry about security and not having to worry about the threats that are looming in our day and age. We had built the aid management system in, in seven days after the war started, and we already made it available for all the emergency teams and, at the border. We've managed to build a system in which every piece of, every piece of uh, res resource was being collected in one single system, and everybody who was distributing aid managed to do it effectively from the closest collection center up to exactly where the need was. And then we managed to set up the housing allocation system. We've seen a ton 
of houses made available on social media. Everybody had an apartment, everybody had a room, everybody had a tent, everybody had an open space for, some, for refugees to, to sleep in. But not everybody was verified, not everybody had the good intentions, and the human trafficking networks were all over the place. We've designed a system in which the authorities, the UN agencies, and the organizations on the ground could actually access verified uh, houses. Houses that had been, had been going through a verification from social services and people who and had been tested against police databases just to save time and prevent these kind of human trafficking attempts. The aid management made it efficient to transport resources from point A to point B in a matter of days. The drivers were verified. We knew what, where every piece of resource is at any moment in time. We trained every single responder. We ensured 24-7 support for every single issue. 4 a.m., 2 a.m., we were there. And yet, I've told you we had so many blind spots that we'll soon be in the dark. While we were busy putting up the most extensive super cyber security system to protect the housing allocation platform and to ensure that everything is safe and space, our UX researcher at the border in an observation visit calls us in and sends us a picture. Somebody had managed to hack the system. They came into the border area with a sticker, with a QR code, and they've put the sticker on top of the governmental poster. So whoever was scanning the government's poster was going to a fake website that was providing housing for refugees. We always need to be ready to hack the system against them. It's so easy to just be fooled and it's getting even, technology enables more and more creative ways to bring harm. I was telling you about the border, I was telling you about the center, I was telling you about the resources, and then we also had to think about the hospitals at the same time. Not everybody crosses the border as easily as, as young, healthy people. You had people with cancer, you had people with HIV, you had people with diabetes, people who needed assistance at every step of the way. Do you know what it feels like for a cancer patient to cross the border? Do you know what it feels like for a person living with HIV not having medication one day or two days or for a week? Do you know what it feels like to go to the gynecologist with a translator in the room? Do you know how it feels like just not to know? It feels super overwhelming. And it's critical to provide access to all this infrastructure. It's critical to provide spaces where people can feel safe to read, to ask, and to talk. And technology can help us that. I'll give you one example. Romania has very few NGOs dealing with people with HIV. The largest one is a three-person NGO, and the smallest one is a one-person NGO who works voluntarily half of the time. She assists around 2,000 people every year. When the war started, her patient's number doubled overnight. The technology she used to have at hand at that moment in time was an Excel file. Now she has a complete case manager, helping her manage her work faster and focus on the patients rather than worrying about how fast is she gonna get to the last pill box. And we built it flexible enough that it allowed us to redeploy it in a few hours for cancer patients, for multiple sclerosis patients, to see at any moment where are the available beds, where are the right specialists, and it was just a mix and match inside a dashboard to connect one person in need with one adequate hospital facility. We scaled in hours for all the chronic patients that were crossing the border. Then school came. Do you know what it takes to mix and match diplomas from one system to another. Do you know what the vaccination scheme looks like for children in Ukraine versus children in Romania? Do you know what it looks like for the ones in Moldova or Hungary? How do you make sure these kids, th these kids are integrated? Chaos started. Teachers didn't know how to approach the, the situations. We didn't have enough room in schools. And technology came in and brought together all of these resources to place order in chaos at that moment. Then there's the state, another actor that refugees come into contact with. Of course, you cross the border, but then you start needing things like IDs. You start needing things like paperwork, translations. You need to enroll in programs. You need access to services. 238 pieces of new regulations in 12 days. This is the amount of new ordinances issued by a single government in the first 12 days of the war all of them addressing either the refugees directly or different entities providing services. Hundreds of pages of legalese that barely made sense to lawyers, clerks, and maybe some few experts. And you, now imagine you're a refugee. You just crossed the border with your three-year-old and with your grandmother who can barely read. 
You have just left everything behind. You're crossing the border. You enter a whole new country. You don't trust anyone, and you don't speak the language. What use does reading an ordinance have for you at that moment? None. And yet it regulates your life as a refugee. So we've connected in the single point of entry a platform with decision trees that helps people understand what they need to do in specific situations. How do I change my driver's license? How do I enroll somebody in a kid? Getting them directly to the answers they need, not skimming through hundreds and hundreds of legal documents. Then there's the job. How do you work in a country that, that you haven't seen before? How do you stay safe in the workspace? What does harassment look like in a new cultural space? Who's your support mechanism when you have these kind of issues with abuse or, or harassment or any kind of other trafficking situations? Dangers are everywhere. And then we've built a women's center for it, just to make sure that information gets to these women and that they understand what type of space they're coming into so we can support them. And then there was the mourning, another thing that you need to think of. And not the mourning only for the people who are left behind, the people you lose in the war, but the people you lose as you're, while you're a refugee. I'll read you a quote from a field visit in a center. I have no idea what to do. My father died. Can I bury him here? Back home, we had an assigned plot of, of land for burial. Can I buy one in Romania? Can I move him to Ukraine once the war is over? I think he would have wanted to be buried with the rest of his family. I just have no idea. A lady at the center told me I should cremate him. But I don't know if people do that here. And I really think he would have preferred a burial. This is a quote from a person whose father died while being in a refugee center and waiting for, for a home to stay in. Life events continue to happen to refugees, either, they, either when they're displaced or not. And when you're most vulnerable, understanding what you can do and what, what the legislation says you can do or cannot do in a completely foreign environment is of highest importance. This is our mission. Our mission is to leave no vulnerable person behind, regardless of how specific or particular or how, or how big or small their needs are. We've taken the mission at Commit Global to unlock this promise of technology for social good and fix the realities on the ground and make sure that we enable information and aid for everybody over there. We identify, we maintain, and bring up to standards critical pieces of civic infrastructure around the world. We train and grow the actors on the ground, and we assist every single NGO to use this technology properly because it's not enough to just throw technology at people, you need to have their back in using it. We need to grant access to technology to everyone working with every vulnerable group yesterday. We ran out of time already and we have to be smart about it. And this launch from us, for us is an open invitation to you all to join our efforts and commit to building the infrastructure we need. Thank you so much. I'll stay here longest for the applause. Actually, I'm actually not leaving. We're up for, for a short or long, however you prefer, q and I'm actually going to invite Bogdan for this one, uh, and I get a well-deserved uh, uh, sit down. Um, we're open to hear any kind of curiosity you have towards Commit Global. We hope, to, uh, we hope to be able to answer each and every one of them, and if not, let's find the answers together. Bogdan, would you like to join us? Thank you. He's telling me to stay here. Fine. <laughs> oh, hey, you have the microphone. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Tessa Reich. I'm a lecturer at The Hague University of Applied Sciences. Um, thank you for a very um, interesting, compelling uh, presentation. You are obviously very ambitious and self-confident, and I wish you all the best. Um, I have a question about, uh, so I used to, before I was uh, working at TUAS, I worked a lot with uh, human rights defenders, uh, particularly also on uh, uh, digital security. And what I've been wondering, and I've, I've even tried to find it on your website, but I couldn't really find out. Um, the, cause uh, you know, what you told us about the, you know, the infrastructure and the software that you've been developing. Uh, it seems like there's a, a few concerns related to privacy, but even to security, right? Especially if you start working with people maybe that are politically active, 
um, you know, how do you actually manage to, how can you, how can you uh, guarantee their, their safety and security online as well? So I've been wondering uh, what sorts of, um, and I'm, I don't have a tech background, but I know there's a couple of things that are always very important to find out, right, when it's about tech. So, you know, what kind of servers are you using? Uh, how do you, do you have your own servers? Um, is your software open source? Uh, I have questions related to that, I guess, sort of more the technical aspects of that without getting too technical because I and perhaps others won't understand. I'll give just a high level answer and then I'm going to allow Olivia to go into all the technological details of it. And we have our CTO here somewhere, so he, yeah, we can pull <laughs> and Andre in if necessary. So first and foremost, a big problem of our civil society right now is that it's not prepared for digitization. It's not only that they don't have access to this sort of infrastructure, they're not prepared. Last year, in I think last September, the Red Cross had a huge data breach with all their servers in the basement in Geneva under their headquarters. They had a huge data breach. Uh, and this is just the beginning of it. And to their credit, they came forward with it, they spoke about it, they shared information about it. Many other organizations have this type of data breaches day in and day night. Uh, one of the things that right now keeps this data safe is the fact that they're not digitized, that you can't access it so easy, that it's on some paperwork or somewhere in their office. Um, one of the things, one of our main objectives in creating this digital infrastructure is putting forward some standards having standards for security, having st standards for data, having standards of how you manage this data among civil society actors. Something that doesn't exist right now. And then I'm... Yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm the product department, representing the product department, so I think I can tackle a bit more uh, on the spot. The, the answer is it depends. It depends on the nature of the data we're working with and it depends on the level of security required by each of them. So one thing we're doing when we're, we're talking about development of our products is that everything is designed to be data privacy first. So if we're working, for instance, with the case managers, this data is stored on servers with a specific level of um, security and with protocols and with access management, depending on who's going to use those systems and with particular training for the ones that are going to use it moving forward. We work with a variety of providers from this perspective. and. Um, we, we separate, and again, I think there's, uh, we would love to, to have an, an entire conversation afterwards together with, uh, with Andre about this. Um, each and every decision when it comes to a, to a digital solution that we put out there is taken by following the necessary requirements for that type of data. So the answer is a multitude of. So there is one place where we host the single uh, entry point for information, and there's one place where we host the housing data and the data of where people are located at every moment in time. Obviously, similarly, we're going to have one place, one type of um, access management for organizations that use a shared infrastructure to provide medical services, and it's a whole different story when we're talking about uh, an application that collects data from uh, from the field or maybe in the aftermath of an earthquake to collect imagery and to collect and to do a lot of data analysis on on those particular topics. There's a lot of nuances, and thank you so much for for the question. I'm looking forward to to go into more details and into all the. Uh, into all the types of uh, infrastructure we set up. One important thing, uh, one last thing with, relate to, with relation to what Bogdan was saying in terms of, of digital infrastructure for civil society organizations is that we've seen a lot, of, a lot of vulnerabilities stemming from the fact that whatever they have now at hand, they're not using it properly. So even where, where there is technology set in place and NGOs do use already some tools or maybe the authorities use some tools in an intervention, we try to go in and basically lift them up by bringing them also up to standard to match the other tools we're deploying to make sure that whatever connection between where we transfer the data among systems is also secured and wherever this data gets, it actually is still is maintained secure. And two more yeah. things which are a matter of principle for us, everything is open source. It's built in public service. It needs to be shared and reused by anybody who wants it. 
And this also creates sustainability in the long run. So even if Commit Global dies tomorrow, somebody else can come in and support this sort of infrastructure, or others can do it. You know. Uh, secondly, the data sits on the servers of the organizations that we're supporting. It doesn't sit, sit with us. So if we deploy a solution to the Romanian government, as we did, it sits on their servers. And we support them, of course, in taking the best decision possible where they don't have the internal expertise. You know, some governments have this expertise, some governments don't. Some NGOs have that expertise, some NGOs don't. So if we deploy a case management solution, for example, for the ICRC, for the Red Cross, it will sit on their servers, but we will also work with them to train them and to make them manage those servers better. And one other thing that we're, we're currently talking with, with the ICRC is trying to convince them, and they seem pretty convinced so far, to share uh, their capacity to stock data in a very secured way in Geneva with other relevant NGOs for a very secure type of information. Because that kind of security in terms of legislation protecting it, the Swiss legislation, the legislation surrounding the RC, ICRC can't be replicated by any other organization in the world. Hi, thanks. I'm Vis from the Dutch Council for Refugees. We spoke a couple of months back, so I, yes. it's nice to see you. Welcome to the Netherlands. Um, and I love the bold statement and your bold um, <laughs> aspirations. Um, well, I've got a very general question, which is you, you, the, your question is, are you ready to commit? So I wanted to ask you, how do you want us as NGOs, but also others in the room to commit? Like, what is it that you expect from partners? Um, and generally, so as you know, I work a lot with NGOs working at the borders of Europe with refugees, and we do capacity building of smaller NGOs that have a lot of the problems that you described. Um, the environment that they work in is not so welcoming and um, refugee friendly. So that's the context they work in. They would need a lot of the tools that you described. So I wanted to ask you if you can elaborate a little bit how these NGOs can benefit from your services, even when their work is sometimes a bit adverse to what the state would want them to do. Um, and I guess a question that underlines it a bit is, what's your financing model? Because those NGOs definitely don't have the resources for this technology, but you need resources somehow to sustain yourself. So could you say a bit about that? So I'll try to take it step by step. What, what we're looking for you in the room in terms of commitment. Uh, it's, it's a mixed group in the room here, as, as mixed as, as the Hague ecosystem. There are, there, there are people that work in government, there are people that work with funders, there are people that work with NGOs. Uh, for the NGOs, you know, the commitment is on our side to provide, and on the, on the side of all the other people in the room, to be able to provide you with this infrastructure. Of course, there are NGOs and NGOs. There are Smaller NGOs, they're medium NGOs, they're ones that are very vulnerable and need this kind of support yesterday. There are also very large NGOs. I was speaking of the ICRC uh, earlier. Many of these very large NGOs are themselves very territorial sometimes. So it's, it's a job in itself making them understand that they need to move to a shared infrastructure, that it doesn't help anybody to have your own uh, case management in the ICRC which you don't want to share with uh, the UNHCR or with IOM. And even between the UN agencies, making sure that they reuse what is being built as a matter of respect for public money, but also as a matter of being less vulnerable in the long run and taking the resources where they need to go. Uh, and this is a work in progress. So depending on the NGO, it might be an easier discussion or it might be a more complicated discussion. For, for the funders in the room and for the people in government in the room, we need to support this capacity so we can offer all this support for free to NGOs. And our model is that we make all of this infrastructure available for free for all the NGOs, no matter how rich the NGO is. So if you're at the ICRC or the one person NGO working with HIV people in Romania, you receive the same solutions free of cost because we don't wanna become an organization that just serves the very powerful uh, civil society organization. For that, of course, we need support. And we're looking for that support among the public and the private funders to be able to sustain in the long run this 
type of infrastructure and offer it for free to you. So right now the model is, is a mixed one, private funders, public funders, uh, and we're going to keep it like that moving forward. And donations work from regular people like any other NGO does. Okay, can yeah. I add just one thing? So on, on the leaflets that you've got in your, in your goodie bag, there's a, a link uh, on, the, on the back that says not slash 911 for Commit Global. If they need something tomorrow, then have them send a message and schedule an appointment. Because if there's something that already exists in the infrastructure and is already built, we're more than happy to provide it as soon as possible. So we hope to have even more capacity. We hope, we hope to be able to respond in as many crises as possible and also build, as Chris was saying, in times of peace and in moments when we have time to actually foresee what the next uh, what the next challenges are going to be and prepare civil society organizations to be able to respond better and faster when uh, when the situation arises. And yeah. one more point of commitment that we're looking for out of the funders and the people in government in the room, also the government that is funding this sort of project, <coughs> to themselves move towards an understanding of share and reuse in the digital space. So even if we look at the European Union and Europe itself, which has a lot of resources, if a migrant, if a refugee enters through Romania or enters through Greece, by the time they get here, by the time they get to the Netherlands or Germany or Sweden, wherever they want to get, they go through seven or eight different systems for managing their situation. At each step of the way, moving from Greece to Bulgaria, moving from Bulgaria to Romania, moving to, from Romania to Hungary, and so on and so forth, they are at risk of human trafficking. And that's because we don't have traceability of what's going on there. So it's not only a waste of money, the fact that we have 27 different systems of civil protection uh, infrastructure across Europe, but it's also a matter of protection for, for the most vulnerable. So one of the things that we're trying to uh, to work on with, with, our person, uh, with our partners in government here and in, uh, in, with other governments around the world and around Europe is a policy of share and reuse within Europe so we can have a shared infrastructure which lowers cost but lowers also vulnerability and also put that in as a requirement for funding when, for example, the European Union is funding projects in humanitarian assistance around the world. If we already funded to build a case management system, let's not fund it again. Go and reuse that system, and let's move the money, because there's a lot of money to, uh, to support on the ground. Yes. And then in the back, yes. Hi, my name is Hilde van der Driet. I'm from Cordate here in The Hague. And, um, well, it makes sense if you say, well, if people move from one country to the other, they need the information from all those countries, but there's also a risk. I mean, refugees uh, are not always welcome in all the countries in Europe. So how do you prevent that your system enables a government like in the Netherlands to say, well, you've already passed through all those countries. Why didn't you ask for asylum or support in those countries? Why did you even ever get here in the Netherlands? I mean, that's not my personal uh, way of looking at things, but that's how it happens here. We don't want the people here, we want to keep them at the country where they came first. So how do you make sure that your system is not going to be misused with all that information in there? So in fact, it's a case by case basis, you know, when you can work or not work with government. Uh, there are places where the government is the problem itself, there are places where the government can be the problem, and there are places where, where the government is reasonable and supportive. Uh, so if we look at the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, if we only look at Eastern Europe, you know, you, you have Romania, you have Poland, countries that are welcoming right now, and where we worked with governments. And then you have Hungary, which is not so welcoming to, uh, to refugees. So there we don't work with government. We don't provide access to this infrastructure for the government. And we, and we just work with civil society, with a strong organization, local or international, that are working there on the ground. So it's, it's a case-by-case case decision that we take together with the other partners, because our role is enabling you when you're working on the ground. It's not only taking this decision on our own, but speaking with the civil society and speaking with the civil society actors in the countries where we intervene and finding the best solution. To, to be clear, our focus is supporting civil society. 
supporting government is a byproduct wherever the government is reasonable and can support civil society itself. Well, that that's makes sense, but I mean, the Dutch government is reasonable <laughs> and supports civil society and would support like Vluchtelingenwerk and coordinate in, in supporting these people. On the other hand, you have other parts of our government that would prefer to send those people back. So still, I see a lot of uh, well, complications in, in making sure that the information is definitely not shared with those who will misuse it. But yeah, I think um, if I just ask this, I think this is the added benefit of providing and implementing and deploying this kind of infrastructure in partnership. If we were an IT company and we would be selling technology, then anybody could buy it, right? But when you're designing an intervention and you bring in the pieces and the bits of like a Lego box of solutions that you need to intervene and who needs to be the actual user or administrator of a specific part of this infrastructure, you can ensure and set in place through partnerships, through documents, through legally binding uh, agreements, and through procedures and processes, how you do intervention by using the infrastructure we provide. And it's not, some, it is not something that is uh, at large, and you can, use, uh, you can use these tools exactly as if you've bought an, an instance of a tool online and you're configuring it as, as you want. This is the benefit of being able to provide this infrastructure for free and to make sure that we work together to deploy things on the ground, rather than just, again, throwing technology out there and just letting it do its thing. And I think this is one of the sort of the safeguarding mechanisms we have embedded in the way we provide and we implement technology, uh, be it the democratic, in democratic scenarios or maybe in the humanitarian assistance space or even just for particular situations in vulnerable groups and so on. Thank you. <laughs> There was I, I think it was in the back. There. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, second row. Oh. Thank you. Hello. My name is Ella Start. I am currently a student at Leiden University studying crisis and security management, and I'm also a senior analyst at a political consultancy in London where I focus mainly on tech and cyber political risk consulting projects for NGOs. Anyways, um, based on my background, one of my questions was actually based on your pamphlet that you provided us, where you talk about good data, increased transparency in the NGO sector by centralizing and opening data to the public. But it seems to me like there is a huge risk in opening up that data and opening up the sources of that data. How do you envision mitigating that? And then I'll have a follow-up question. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but go um, ahead. Yes, the good data is actually one of the solutions that is part of the ecosystem for civil society. And it, refer it, it works like this. So the civil society ecosystem also has a single sign-on system. Yeah, as an NGO, you go on NGO Hub, you create an account, and then you gain access to a suite of applications that handle things for you from building a website, from setting up donations, from um, ensuring that you're able to um, to work with volunteers and manage different amounts of um, different tasks, internal tasks for you as an NGO. What the good data platform takes out uh, of that is actually a number of, is trying to bring clarity on the dimensions of the work that civil society actually does. So based on the activity you have in the platforms, the services you configure in the platform, uh, the number of volunteers you have and things like this, the good data platform actually takes this data and makes sense out of it. So you can go in and see we have these many NGOs doing these so many doing humanitarian work. So many volunteers are engaged in this kind of work. So it's aggregated data about actually how large and how big the impact of civil society organizations is. Is data about usage and about intervention is definitely not data about people assisted or personal data from, from beneficiaries and things like this. It's actually a way of understanding exactly how much work NGOs do in providing social or medical or other types of support. And yeah. an <laughs> important mention is that on the leaflets you have the building blocks of the civil society ecosystem and the humanitarian ecosystem. Uh, our planet, you know, that's the maximum ecosystem. We'll not always deploy all the solutions in all geographies. It depends on the place. So when we deploy 
this system to France, of course, is very interesting to see the capacity of civil society, what are the large, what are the small NGOs, how do they work. If we deploy it in an autocratic country in the Middle East, we, we won't deploy that, that solution, yeah. I think there was... Uh, there is one question there. I, I think that's... You were first. Yeah. Were you? Yeah, I think you were first. And there was, there was a question. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm Robert Okello. I work with an organization based in the Hague here called Barefoot Law. It's uh, developing digital solutions to provide or extend access to justice to co grassroots communities. Um, we work in Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, um, mostly in Africa. Uh, my question is a follow-up on the conversation around um, governments who are welcoming. Um, from, from my experience, for example, um, in the context where we work, um, you're excited, you develop these digital tools and communities are using it. And then the next day, the government has switched off the internet and uh, a tax has been introduced. Um, you know, a complete policy of discouraging using internet or, you know, these ambitions. We are the people we've been waiting for, you know, all this hype. Um, have you dealt with this situation? And if you've dealt with it, how have you overcome? What are some of the experience and, you know? Yeah, of course, there are, there are geographies and there are places where uh, it's very hard to set up any kind of civic infrastructure because it will just be taken down by the government. Uh, so in these places, we also do a lot of work training and protecting the people that do the civic work, either journalists or people in NGOs, how to use technology. Uh, but we also try to build when we think about the solutions for, for these places, we, we try to think of potential Trojan, let's call them Trojan horses, uh, that, that can't be noticed as, as, as what they are. Uh, I can give, can't give a lot of details now, but a lot of our work with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been on trying to help uh, bring back the, the kids, uh, the Ukrainian kids from Russia. Of course, you know, the Russian authorities can, can close any, you know, if we build a website and say, you know, click here, put your details, if you've been, uh, if, if you've been taken to Russia and we're gonna help, it, that will not work. So we need to think in creative ways on, on how to get to them. And that's the part where the specialists like Olivia come in, the user experience designers, so that really understand all the nuances of what is happening on the ground and can design a solution by starting from that. And unfortunately, I'm, and I'm using this opportunity because I know we have people from universities here, and this is one of our objective here being in The Hague, uh, is the fact that we're not training these people right now. Uh, the user, user experience designers working for public service. We, of course, train in a lot of universities around the world, people doing user experience designer for, for, for business, that's great. Uh, but it's something very different, building a solutions like the one we were talking about, thinking about the risks of the government stealing the data or the government uh, trying to help the government uh, help other people compared to building the new, I don't know, the new internet banking of ING. It's, it's not a matter of the complexity of technology there, it's, it's a way of thinking when you build it. And I think we need to do a better job uh, us as Commit Global to have the specialists for tomorrow, but also in cooperation with universities to try and start training the people that can design these solutions and can understand those, those realities on the ground. Because I'll be honest, we don't have enough of them right now. I think we're going to take one more question. Uh, as I get signs that I'm sitting between you and drinks, so <laughs> we'll have plenty of time to answer, but please. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Olga Gershunya, and I'm here representing Health Tech Without Borders. We are a small NGO, a global one. And uh, I, I, try, I will try to keep it brief.
As, as you mentioned, that uh, there is uh, urgency to <laughs> finalize the meeting. <laughs> so my question would be um, on mental health. Yeah. So as, as we started, well, our NGO started with technological support, but then we uh, quite, um, well, how do you say, we well, moved to mental health support, especially to our uh, psychologists. So we are providing, we're trying to, to support the, let's just say, the clinicians uh, who yeah. are providing mental health support. So I was wondering, how do you tackle mental health yeah. uh, issue at your organization? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm really happy you, you asked about this. I had three whole paragraphs about it, but I realized I wasn't going to be able to fit it all in. So uh, in terms of mental health, we've been working with the US Veteran Affairs Department who have a, a very extensive experience with working with veterans and with people with PTSD. And looking, researching on what the services available are, for example, in the bordering countries of Ukraine uh, for PTSD support and, and these kind of um, mental health services, we're, we've managed to set up um, a digital solution um, so we're replicating the PTSD coach and um, adapting it for uh, this type of uh, critical situation as well as for refugees themselves, rather more than just veterans. And we're also adding a module dedicated to first responders because as I was saying, none of the NGOs in Romania up to that point have been humanitarian ones, but after one year or a year and a half of providing services and coming in contact with a very, very different reality than theirs, they definitely need to be uh, supported in making sure they can help people that end up in a crisis uh, in the centers or in whatever place they provide services at. So we are working at enabling expert content and expert support in getting to people's mobile phones and getting into people's websites and in refugee centers to be used by the people who are managing those centers to be able to sort of offer first mental health aid, um, just to make sure they can um, ensure and provide services for people up until they manage to find the proper uh, services. There was a huge problem because I, I'm sure you know that the Ukrainian therapists could not be employed in other European countries and they couldn't equivalent their, um, their diploma. So even, even if we did have access to them, we couldn't actually manage to get them to provide services in a completely official and legal manner. So we tried to figure out one way to enable as much support network around the situation in order to, until different solutions were found. So what technology can, can actually do at this point in time is to, to make sure that they bring, it brings in those tools and instruments that can at least ensure the minimum delivery of service possible in these situations up until you do manage to get that person into a place where they can get a full range of services that they need. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to spend an hour and a half with you up to this point, and I'm looking forward to the next hours. Uh, and I'm going to invite you next room where we have wonderful things to drink and to eat, I think. Uh, and looking forward to talking to each and every one of you um, and then work together. I'll be relocating to The Hague in just a few weeks, two or three. So make sure you clear your schedule because I'm planning to take you out for coffee each and every one of you. Thank you so much for being here.